The nations we sometimes collectively refer to as the Third World now contain nearly 80% of the Earth's population. And yet the people living in those countries only have access to about 20% of the Earth's wealth, even when that wealth originates in their countries. People like you and me, on the other hand, who live in the more developed nations, make up only 20% of the Earth's population, yet we own, control, and consume nearly 80% of the Earth's resources, even when those resources, like this coffee, originate in the third world. My name is Rick McDaniel. I'm the International Program Director for the YMCA of Fredericton. And in this series, I'm reflecting on the relationship that exists between the 80% of the Earth's majority who live in what we call the third world and the 20% of the rest of us who don't. This cup of coffee isn't a bad place to begin. Nations are pretty much rich or poor for the same reason people are. It basically comes down to how much money you're bringing in. When we talk about countries, we talk about their per capita gross national product. Now, that's a number that's calculated by taking all of the wealth generated in a country during a year and dividing it by the population. The number doesn't tell you how that wealth is distributed, so you could have a country with a fairly high GNP, and yet the majority of the population would be poor if all of that wealth were concentrated in the hands of a few. Still, as a rough way of measuring the relative wealth of nations, it's a pretty useful tool. Canada's per capita gross national product, for example, is around 21,000 US dollars, which makes us one of the world's stronger economies. The per capita gross national product of El Salvador, on the other hand, is only $1,170. And the per capita GNP of Kenya is about $310. $310 isn't much. With my watch, contact lenses, and boots, I'm wearing things that are worth more than $310 right now. One of the primary ways that countries earn money is by selling things to other countries. That's what we call their exports. Canada's primary exports are automobiles and automobile parts. The primary export of both El Salvador and Kenya, on the other hand, is coffee. Now, you don't need to be much of an economist to figure out that an economy based on the manufacture of things like automobiles is going to be stronger than an economy based on the production of coffee. The total amount of wealth generated in a country during a year is going to necessarily affect the quality of life in that country. It's going to affect health care, education, life expectancy, and so on. Let's just consider life expectancy for a moment. The life expectancy of a Canadian at birth is 77 years. The life expectancy of a Salvadoran is 10 years less, 67. But the life expectancy of a Kenyan at birth is only 59. And life expectancy in these countries is low because of their relative poverty. And the poverty of a nation like Kenya is due in large part to the fact that its economy depends primarily on the export of commodity products like coffee. The economies of most third world countries have traditionally been based on commodity production or more recently on low paying factory jobs. The question we want to look at now is how this situation came about in the first place. Why is it that one group of countries became relatively rich while so many others remained poor. The interesting thing about this question is that things haven't always been the way they are now. In fact, at one time, two countries which we now think of as poor third world nations, India and China, were the richest countries in the world. We have to look back a long way in history to get to that time, but it might be worth doing so in order to see how things came to be as they are today. Let's go back to Christopher Columbus. The reason that Columbus set sail from Spain in 1492 was in order to try to reach China and India by going west. He wanted to do that because at the time, China and India were the two most advanced civilizations on the planet. <laughs> 
Their goods, spices, silk, porcelain ware, copper and brass tools, and gunpowder, were the luxury goods of the 15th century. For centuries, European traders traveled to India and China along what were called the spice routes. But then in the 13th century, the Mongols came sweeping down from Central Asia and cut off those routes. So an alternate way to the Orient was sought, and that's where Columbus entered the picture. His basic concept, sailing west around the world to get to India and China, was sound. He just underestimated how far west he was going to have to go to get there. So he ended up landing instead in what we now call the West Indies. West India. Get it? Of course, Columbus didn't realize at first that he had not reached his destination. In fact, his original assumption was that Cuba was the mainland of Asia and that the island of Hispaniola, now shared by Haiti and the Dominican Republic, was Japan. But once the Spanish and other European nations discovered that this was a new world and that it didn't belong to anyone, the race to colonize the Americas was on. The idea that the lands didn't belong to anyone was, of course, a matter of point of view. But you see, the point of view of most Europeans in the 15th century was that the native populations in places like the Americas were savages who didn't have any rights. When Columbus arrived in the Caribbean, the islands were populated by the Arawak and Carib peoples. There were as many as five million people living on the island of Hispaniola alone. Within 100 years, that entire population was eradicated. Many died because they didn't have resistance to the diseases that the Europeans brought with them. The rest were hunted down and slaughtered. Columbus's primary interest in islands like Hispaniola was in the gold he found there. But the gold was quickly exhausted, and the Spanish lost interest in the islands as they pursued their quest for precious metals in Central and South America. Then, early in the 17th century, the island's agricultural potential was discovered. The Dutch were the first to learn that sugar grew well here, even though it wasn't native to the region and sugar was a very valuable commodity. In the 1600s, sugar was a luxury item in Europe. Pharmacies sold it by the gram. When it was discovered that sugar thrived in the West Indies, the British established large plantations in Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, St. Kitts, and elsewhere. These plantations required large amounts of labor, and because the native population had been eliminated, Europe had to seek that labor elsewhere. They found it in Africa. Slaves from the west coast of Africa were bought or captured and transported to these sugar islands. They were packed on board the slave ships as cargo. Each slave was allotted a space less than six feet long and only 16 inches wide. Less room, as the former Prime Minister of Trinidad, Eric Williams, put it, than a man had in a coffin. The slave plantations of the West Indies quickly became the most valuable possessions in the British Empire. Before the end of the 17th century, tiny St. Kitts with a total area of 67 square miles was considered more valuable than all of British North America because it produced sugar. Historians of this era have suggested that the profit from these sugar islands financed the British Industrial Revolution. It was called the Triangle Route. Ships carrying sugar or cotton or other raw materials from the New World brought them back to England, where they were sold at a profit, processed by the newly developing manufacturing industry, and sold again at a greater profit. Manufactured goods were then loaded on these same ships and traded along the African coast for slaves. The slaves were transported to the New World, sold, again earning a profit. The ships were loaded up with sugar and agricultural products, went back to England, and on and on and on. Africa and the Caribbean islands provided the labor and the raw materials for this trade, but the Europeans were the ones who profited. <laughs> 
Then, in the mid-19th century, the British sugar trade in the Caribbean started to come under stiff competition from Brazil and the larger Spanish islands. Plantations were no longer as profitable as they had been, and owners could no longer afford to maintain large slave holdings. So, in 1834, slavery was abolished throughout the British Empire, primarily for economic rather than humanitarian reasons. With abolition, the plantation owners were no longer under any obligation to feed or otherwise maintain their former slaves, who now had to seek wage employment on those same plantations or work small farms on marginal land. Today, the economies of the Caribbean nations are still primarily based in agriculture, although there's some mineral production as well. Jamaica, for example, is a major producer of bauxite from which we derive aluminum. But the agricultural products grown there are grown for export. Sugar, citrus fruit, bananas. Surprisingly, not one of the Caribbean islands is self-sufficient in food production for its own population. And of course, manufactured goods continue to be imported from more developed countries. That's the legacy of colonialism in the Caribbean. Because you see, the resources of colonized areas were never developed to meet even the basic needs of the local population. They were developed for the benefit of someone else, for the benefit of the colonizing power. Europe profited enormously from the triangle trade. The Caribbean and Africa did not. When we examine the histories of the countries that now make up the third world, we see that while there are enormous differences between them, there are usually three characteristics they have in common. First, virtually every one of these countries was, at one time or another, colonized by another power. Second, as a result of this colonial experience, their resources weren't developed to meet the needs of the local population, but rather to satisfy the desires of the colonizing power. And third, they were colonized for their raw materials and primary commodities, which remain their major exports even today. What colonialism did was establish structures which continue to affect the development of third world countries even now. Okay, but what about Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand? These areas were also colonized, and yet they're among the strongest nations in the world now. And while that's true, consider for a moment how things look from the point of view of Canada's First Nations, the Aboriginal peoples. One of the characteristics of colonialism, whether in Canada or South America, in the United States or in Africa, is that the native cultures in these territories were disrupted and their development redirected by the arrival of the Europeans. Keep in mind that the lands which Europe claimed during this period of colonial expansion were already occupied. Many of these territories had very sophisticated, often very wealthy cultures in place. But the local patterns of growth and development were disrupted by the arrival of the Europeans. In the Caribbean, the local population was eliminated. Then a foreign slave population was transported to the islands. In North America, Australia, and New Zealand, the local population was displaced, forced off their lands, and then an immigrant European population moved in, bringing with them their own patterns of development. Those countries became, in effect, cultural extensions of Europe, which is obvious in any one of those countries today. In other areas, Africa, Asia, Latin America, the local populations might have stayed in place, but they lost the ability to control their own destinies. Let's consider Africa. Europe conquered Africa in the 19th century, dividing the continent into territories. France, England, Portugal, Germany, and Belgium all claimed lands and established borders which defined the limits of their possessions. These later became the territorial boundaries of modern African nations, although these European borders cut across traditional tribal lands and even included rival tribes within the same political jurisdiction, 
often with tragic results in our day. At the time we're taping this series, the genocidal conflict between the Tutsi and the Hutu in Rwanda is a clear example. Before the European invasion, African farmers worked some of the most productive farmland in the world. These lands were what attracted Europeans to places like Zimbabwe and Kenya. The settlers came there in order to farm. They appropriated the best lands from the native populations and developed estates which produced crops for foreign consumption, crops like coffee, cotton, and tea. The labor on these estates was provided by Africans, now reduced to the status of serfs on the lands which had once been their own. As with the Caribbean, the resources of these areas weren't developed for the benefit of the local population, but for the benefit of the colonial power. So what happened after the colonial powers left? When African nations regained control over their own resources, did things get better? Obviously not. And that brings us to a fourth characteristic which developing countries have in common, the economic debt they owe foreign banks. You see, independence for many African nations came in the 1960s and 70s. That was a time of global economic growth. The newly independent nations sought to take advantage of these opportunity for economic expansion by modernizing. Their feeling was that if they could become more industrialized, they would become more developed. However, in order to get started, they needed foreign exchange. Foreign exchange is the ability to purchase goods or services from another country. Suppose that I'd like to subscribe to a magazine that's only published in the United States. Well, I might have to pay for that subscription in US dollars. That's the foreign exchange. There are basically three ways to acquire foreign exchange. The first is to purchase it. That's what we do when we exchange Canadian dollars for US dollars. In order to get my magazine subscription, I might go to a bank and purchase a US money order. The second way is by earning it. African nations which couldn't afford to buy foreign currency could best earn it by continuing to sell the commodity products that other countries wanted. So after their colonial masters left, these nations continued to produce export crops in order to get the money they needed to buy manufactured goods, oil, medicines, and military equipment. Unfortunately, the prices earned by agricultural commodities on world markets fluctuate a great deal. Between 1980 and 1987, for instance, commodity prices fell 40%, while the price of manufactured goods and oil continued to rise. If you can't afford to purchase foreign exchange, and you don't have an ability to earn it, then there is a third way to acquire it. You can borrow it. And that's what many African nations did. The really big loans came after 1973. That's when world banks began actively pursuing developing countries, offering them some pretty spectacular incentives to borrow money. The banks did this because they were flooded with the so-called petrodollars after the OPEC nations raised the price of oil in the 70s. These petroleum exporting countries acquired huge profits that they deposited in Western banks. The banks found themselves with unexpectedly large cash reserves on which they had to pay interest. And since a bank doesn't make money by paying interest, but rather by loaning out the money they have on deposit, they had to look for customers. Their usual customers, the private business sector in the North, were experiencing a recession because of the rise in oil prices. So they turned to the third world. Now, under normal circumstances, these third world countries probably wouldn't have been considered credit worthy. But the banks were in a desperate situation. They couldn't afford to pay interest on the deposits they had unless they could find someone to loan that deposited money to. And the interest rates they were willing to offer third world countries were very attractive. In some cases, the interest rate would be fixed so that the actual rate paid would be adjusted by the current level of inflation. For example, let's say that the interest rate is 10%, the inflation rate is 8%, then what you pay is 10 minus 8, 
or 2%. This arrangement even resulted at times in negative rates of interest. Let's keep the example simple and say the interest rate is still 10%, but now the inflation rate has risen to 12%. In this case, the actual interest would be 10 minus 12, or a negative 2%. In other words, the borrowing country receives a 2% payment for having the loan. That's a difficult offer to pass up. It all came to an end, however, in 1981. That's when the United States, in an attempt to control domestic inflation, raised interest rates. That set off a chain reaction around the world. Interest rates began climbing. Soon, African nations found themselves with such enormous debt burdens that in many cases, they couldn't even afford to pay the interest due on their loans. That's how the third world debt crisis came about. And the only way the nations of Africa saw to cope with their debt was by producing more and more export crops, even at the cost of depriving themselves of the basic necessities of life, like food. I began working here at the Y in 1985 a time when the consciences of people around the world were stricken by the images of starvation we saw coming from Ethiopia and the Sahel region of Africa, as hundreds of thousands of people died as a result of the 1983 and 84 droughts. In Fredericton, the YMCA, in cooperation with students at the University of New Brunswick and St. Thomas University, raised $30,000 in a matter of weeks similar efforts took place all across the country. But the people donating the money didn't realize that during the same period, cotton exports from the Sahel actually increased. What that means is that there were active, productive farms throughout the Sahel during the drought. But they were growing cotton for export rather than food for local consumption. At the risk of oversimplifying a very complex issue, one of the factors contributing to the inability of certain African nations to feed themselves is that their most productive farmlands are being used for export crops for those of us who live in the north. And they're caught in this trap because they still need foreign currency to purchase goods and services they require and can't provide for themselves yet, and in order to service their foreign debt. Without a doubt, the debt's the single greatest factor hindering development in the South today, a debt so large that many third world countries are unable to make their bank payments, let alone have any real hope of ever being able to pay it off. Country after country in the third world has had to turn to the International Monetary Fund in order to borrow more money just so they can make their interest payments and continue operating. But in order to qualify for an IMF loan, countries have to agree to certain conditions. These are called structural adjustments. The local currency can be devalued. Local interest rates will go up. That almost always results in higher unemployment. Then the IMF can ask the government to reduce spending. That brings us to a situation we're familiar with in Canada. When governments have to make financial cuts, social programs are a favored target. There are people in Canada who think that the cuts that have been made to our social programs have been pretty devastating. The situation in the third world is much more dire. The UNICEF report on the status of the world's children puts it bluntly. Kids in developing countries are dying as a result of the austerity measures imposed in these countries. And in spite of these measures, the debt isn't getting any smaller. Several third world leaders have pointed out that their countries have already paid back the original amounts borrowed in the interest payments they've made, and yet they're no closer to paying off their debt. I think that ultimately, we're going to have to recognize that the way it's structured, the debt can't be paid off. And eventually, it will need to be forgiven. But who gets to make that decision? What individual or a group of individuals has the authority to forgive the third world debt? Well, clearly it's not you or me. And that brings us to a problem that many people confront when they're reminded of the issues that we've been examining in this series. Many people of goodwill, 
people concerned about social issues feel helpless and frustrated when they think about the problems and difficulties that exist in the third world. Programs like this one make us feel bad, but also make us feel powerless. We almost don't want this information because all too often we feel there's nothing we can do with it except feel guilty. That doesn't do either us or the third world any good at all. What we need then is some means by which either individually or collectively we can respond to the information we're acquiring about the third world. And that's what we're going to be looking for in our next program. The New Brunswick Community Television Archive, exploring New Brunswick's history of community television programming, is an educational initiative of CHCO-TV.